you've got a microphone somewhere, yes. Thank, you. Thank you very much. My name is Francesco Mazzaferro. I'm head of the GSOB Secretariat. I, I wanted a bit to react to the question of Professor Gelfern on where is the constitutional element here. So if we look at, um, at the logo, what you see there is a European flag. So first of all, you have a European element and you have the European system of financial supervision. So this has been part of a policy response uh, which uh, came on purpose, bringing together three European authorities and uh, one board, which were created each in its own uh, competence. What we have been doing uh, when we were established, by the way, was uh, to recommend, first of all, the creation of national authorities. So there was a recommendation we issued to, to have macroprudential authorities everywhere, a second one to identify what would have been the policy purposes, the objectives, and then a third one to try to see what would be the instruments and the, and the, and the data sources. And I think we are now testing all of this. And by the way, it's not by coincidence uh, that yesterday the Commission has decided to propose on the same day a review of uh, all the institutions. And uh, I think uh, in a few minutes the Vice President of Commission will give a constitutional speech. Now, this does not mean that we have the best. This means, however, that it exists. We are testing it. It's not that we are outside of a framework. We have a framework which exists. Um, <coughs> to Professor Posner, the question whether um, legislation should be uh, cyclical or not. In policy terms, it depends on whether the problem is a flow problem or it is a stock problem. And it is also crucially on whether you want to address the velocity, if you want, of the economy, the speed, or whether you want to increase resilience. All in all, the experience which we have is that we are in a phase where the best which we can do is to increase resilience. Uh, why? First, we don't know very well the transmission mechanism. So we would not be able to know what is the timing by which the input of legislation is transmitted to the economy. Second, if we were doing two years in which we are uh, applying a mere and three years in which we are not applying it, this would create a situation of uncertainty in the economy, which would be, uh, I think, extremely serious. And third, uh, to pass legislation takes time. So even if we wanted to uh, have a legislation which is timely connected with uh, a financial cycle, a parliament will never be able to do it. Thank you. Responses to that. Anna first. Oh, I agree completely. Um, I think my point was not so much that uh, the ESRB operates outside a constitutional framework. In fact, Europe is fascinating because of this ongoing constitutional moment and the fact that there's actually so much treaty making going on, but rather that we not lose track of what you were talking about in all the pixelation of capturing and mapping the risks, and also that some of the process you're talking about be not just going on, but be publicly accessible and intelligible. Um, so that you then don't end up on the receiving end of the, you know, a cabal of technocrats behind closed doors came up with a document none of us can understand what gives, right? Then saying that they have a flag on their letterhead is not going to go far enough in response to that. So totally agree. Uh, yeah, just a quick response. I, I agree with your concerns, but just a technical point, um, which I was not clear about. In the United States, we make a distinction between legislation and regulation, and you do in Europe as well, but the legislation is passed by the legislature. The regulatory agencies issue rules which are called regulations, and they don't need the legislature to, to do it. They do it themselves, and the, and the reason why they can do it is that the legislature gives them the authority or competence to issue these rules. And because the regulators are these hierarchical institutions with one person at the top, they can issue these rules very quickly, and they can also suspend them. And, they, and since they also enforce the rules, they can stop enforcing them if they want to, which they often do. 
And so, um, uh, at least in principle, uh, the regulators have enough flexibility to act extremely quickly in response um, to uh, a, a downturn or a financial crisis or what have you. Floor open again. Look up. Thank, thank you, Federico Signorini, uh, Bank of Italy. Uh, I was intrigued by, by the, the, the subject of uh, Mr. Posner's uh, initial talk. Uh, shouldn't uh, um, regulation be counter cyclical? And m my immediate reaction was that at least it, we should strive to avoid being pro cyclical. And I'm not sure that, that we're entirely, entirely free of that. Uh, uh, and, and then he, uh, Professor Posner, went, went on. Um, mostly uh, talking about the, the potential for discretionary um, uh, counter-cyclicality of regulation. And he said, yes, it con it's conceivable there may have been one or two um, cases, but uh, it's, it's difficult be because you have to take account of the dead weight losses and the, 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 the issues with the decision process, et cetera, et cetera. So in, in, in the end, in on balance, it sounded more like a thumbs down. Um, but in, uh, to the, towards the end of his presentation, he touched on the issue that for me is central, which is automatic stabilizers. And uh, um, I, I think that the, 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 the framework of prudential policy in general, macro prudential more specifically, does contain some implicit or explicit automatic or semi-automatic stabilizer, including, for instance, the counter-cyclical buffer. But the issue is, um, I mean, that there is, there is also the, the, the possibility of having in at least in the now field, automatic destabilizers. And I, and I think that, uh, for instance, uh, President Draghi, when, when introducing this, this session, he, he mentioned a possible issue with uh, the accounting rules for uh, provisions, for, for credit provisions, when, we, when he said it's, it's um, much better in the past for, for in, in some respect. But it, we, we have to recognize that this means that the, uh, that the effect on the, the, the effect might, might be procyclical, in, 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 in and so we have to think about that. And that's one issue. And I think there are other issues, for instance, in some um, the, the regulation of some uh, market transactions. Think of the of, of things like um, you know um, margining requirements or haircuts in a crisis. I think this is also extremely important in terms of stability uh, in 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 the moment and uh, at the moment when when markets are are, um, are experiencing troubles. So um, shouldn't we think? more specifically and more systematically, I would say, about the existence or the sufficiency of, of um, inherent implicit uh, stabilizers and possibly inherent implicit destabilizers. Should, shouldn't that be a lens through which we systematically look at the, at the, at the, at the, uh, at the regulatory framework and supervisory practices? I think this is worth, uh, worthy of some further, further reflection. What's that first, Eric? Yeah, yeah, thank thank you very much. I, I, I like that way that you put that, and uh, that is part of what motivated the paper, the worry that ordinary regulations are, 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 are um, frequently pro-cyclical. Um, uh, environmental regulations can be like that. You might think of minimum wage and other uh, worker employment, uh, worker uh, protection regulations. Often they're not binding during a boom because uh, employers are eager to hire people and will pay them and provide them benefits, and so they only come into play uh, during a, a recession. So I, I accept uh, your, um, your comments. Kern, you want to weigh in on this one? Uh, very good points about this issue of contra-cyclicality versus pro-cyclicality, and, and, and I'd like to think of it in, in a very basic sense in which you know, markets, are, financial markets are, are volatile by, by nature, and, and we should think of regulation in a way, as leaning against the wind. When the wind's blowing one way, we want regulation to stand or lean in the other direction. And that's why, ideally, with contracyclical capital, when we've got uh, a slowdown in the economy, a recession, we want to loosen the, the capital requirements for banks so that they might lend more. And, and, and so therefore you, you, and so that's the idea between the CRD4 here in Europe is that you do have that ability to reduce the capital requirement so that banks can eat into that buffer they've built up. But when we're in a boom, when the market is frothy, you know, and we, we have that housing market bubble that we'll, we will always have, that we had, that regulation should lean against that and then have higher capital requirements during that upturn in the market. Regulation should not reinforce market trends. 
in, in a way, you know, very crude way. It's like Alan Greenspan saying, you know, it's about taking the punch, you know, the punch bowl away from the party when it gets a bit too too wild. And so, in regulation, you know, in, in a contracyclical way, should should be thought about that too. I would say. And one thing about the contracts, private contracts, I want to add was in the EU now we've we've got regulators like ISMA, this European Securities Market Authority, that has the power to ban the short selling of bank stocks during a crisis, during a bank crisis. And and they can and ISMA uh, under the MIFID II directive can ban financial products, certain financial products that are viewed to be too risky and, and potentially posing a, a broad risk to society, to, to consumers. In the UK, we had this problem with the mis-selling of uh, PPI, uh, 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 the, the insurance, credit insurance risk uh, policies that banks were selling. And so in the future now, regulators will have that power. Now, of course, there will be collateral damage from that. You know, regulators might ban the wrong product or they might uh, they, they might uh, tell banks that, or tell investors you can't short sell stocks during a period in time when maybe we, we think the investors should be able to short sell stocks because it's a signal to the market that the bank is not doing so well. Um, so, but, 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 grow, but there are growing regulatory intervention tools to restrict the operation of private contracts. Now, whether or not they have the economic, uh, Eric was worried about the, the legal uh, uh, constitutional type issues the, gov the regulator might have for if they intervene and, and restructure contracts. I'm, I guess I'm more worried about the, the fact that the, there, there will be an efficiency impact of regulators using these strong tools to block products or to block uh, the short selling of, of bank stocks in the markets. Anna, you had a brief. Yeah, just very briefly. So when you have an uh, ex-ante rule uh, or a mechanism that is automatically uh, pro-cyclical, uh, then you have three choices. You can either let it play itself out and let the losses lie where they may, right? Um, two, you can let it play out and then have a compensation scheme in place, right? Or you can override. and. The choice among those three partly depends on how much do you want to build faith in these automatic institutions, right? Because an override is going to work once, but then you're not going to be able to use any of these automatic um, tools again, right? So then your choice really becomes, is it implement and let losses lie where they may, implement and compensate, and those have different uh, elements to them. Davide Serra from Algebras Investments. I have three quick questions for the panel. The first one, so if I take rating agents in the US, the $1 trillion loss, which equates, let's say, to 15 times the losses in Greece, where, because of the Fourth Amendment in the States, private, public, so not accountable. And how can we have $1 trillion losses on AAA and no one being accountable. Both private uh, agency, the rating agency, and the regulators that have used them, like, you know, CEOs use McKinsey to cover their back, so to say no one is accountable, yeah? So it's a way to basically mitigate risk. Always someone else is accountable, I wanna keep my job. The second question, um, there have been two instances in Europe. So if I take Bank of Spain, they had anti-cyclical provisioning, they were taken to court by the European Commission because they was deemed illegal. Yeah, that's in the 97-98, uh, Jaime Caruana was governor of the Bank of Spain, I remember very clearly, and now it's the new gold standard. So I see a change. Mm. The, sa the same applies to the Basel Committee. 2005-06, QS3 study of the Basel Committee, 600 billion euro of capital in the European banking system. They said there was 50 too much, yeah, on numbers. Mm. Now we have 1.5 trillion, so three times more, and they keep on telling us we need more. So there is a swing of 3x. I haven't seen many people being fired in the Basel Committee or in central banks. They were wrong directionally by more than 300%. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. from the, as an investor and as a, as a private citizen, who can I hold accountable? Because if a buck, always has to stop with the private citizen that loses his job or the investor of a saver that loses his job. But whoever has to regulate is always winning. Yep. 
so including compliance officers, regulators, and central mm -hmm. bankers, mm -hmm. then eventually populism will rise, which is, by the way, what happened in Anglo-Saxon country, where the bill of the banking crisis has been five to six times larger than in Europe, mm -hmm. U.S. and U.K. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's uh, a handful to go at. Who wants to start? Eric. Yeah, so th it, it's a great question. Um, I think the rating agencies actually did end up having to pay some money. They were originally sued for giving, you know, the wrong, you know, putting the wrong agencies and, and, and their defense uh, putting the wrong uh, ratings on these, on, these, um, instru on these instruments. Their defense was the First Amendment, not the Fourth Amendment. It was free speech. Uh, and only in America could you win on that argument, but they, they won, you know. <laughs> We make a distinction between facts and law, and so, oh, sorry, facts and opinion. So if you if you're just expressing your opinion, uh, you can't you can't uh, <laughs> you can't get in trouble. But they, they ended up having to pay some money, not a lot of money. I think the SEC uh, collected against them. Yeah, recently. Yeah, recently. But your your broader question is why can't you sue the regulators? The problem with suing the regulators is that the citizens end up you know paying the money. So if you sue the Fed. Some people sued the Fed. Um, AIG, the shareholders of AIG, for example, sued the Fed. And uh, if they had won, it's being appealed right now, they could have won as much as 20, billion, 20 to $30 billion. But the Fed, of course, just turns over money to the Treasury, so that would mean 20 or $30 billion less for the Treasury, which mean that taxes would have to go up. Uh, th this is a basic problem with using litigation to try to constrain the government. It's just not clear uh, that uh, the people who run the agencies care if the, if the public fisc uh, ends up paying um, the damages that they, that, they, that they caused. And the only uh, constraint is really political. Uh, if people are unhappy, they can kick people out of, the, out of office, which is why we have Donald Trump as our president now. So there you go. <laughs> which is that we haven't said very specifically about how do you make these decisions between ex ante and ex post um, intervention. And um, you know, the rating agency argument is that we have a product that is created for purpose A. You guys, the regulators, appropriated for purpose B. Not my fault, right? And the, I think that that, um, mechanism, that dynamic, it was understood, people were writing about it, but nobody really sort of thought it was that important, right? So this appropriation of private mechanisms for public regulatory purposes is seen as almost indispensable, inevitable, because of the information asymmetry, right? So, you know, the, the natural sort of the lawyer response to that is, so how do we proceduralize that in a way that is more transparent, more accountable, ex ante, and then formalize that ex post. I certainly don't have the answer, but I think that it's a problem of structuring the relationship between public and private inputs in the regulation. Uh, very quickly, another example. So nest table funding ratio, as you mentioned it. So when it came out, I did the numbers. On the planet, we were missing five trillion of deposits to meet that target, okay? It's like saying, by 2020, I want all electric cars. Nice to say, there's not enough lithium, not enough cars. So I remember I published a paper saying, well, you put a target that is unrealistic. Unless five trillion from deposits from Mars come or people are forced to sell other assets. Well, guess what? Everybody did the work, then eventually, you know, we gave up on net stable funding ratio or keep on delaying it. So the issue is, should regulatory authority, when they put forward what they think we should have, which is an uh, optimal world, actually be responsible for the unintended consequences of the realism of their own forecast? Because it looks like, you know, it's good to come with statements, but the practical feasibility has to be studied. In your experience in the States or in Europe, is there anything we can improve on this?
Well, I would just say the issue of supervisory liability, the legal standards vary from uh, between different states in Europe. There's no EU standard for supervisory liability. Um, when thinking about supervisory liability, there are different standards. There's a negligence standard in some countries like Switzerland. In the UK, there's a standard that's almost impossible to meet. It's, it, it's, it's, it's recklessness to such an extent that the regulator knew they were doing a bad act, which is, for the invest in the BCCI case was an example of that where the, where the, uh, the shareholders uh, uh, sued and, uh, and, 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 and because the, the, the Bank of England had turned a blind eye. So, so you have different standards for holding supervisors liable. But first of all, you'd have to show a standard of care first, at least at a minimum, if you're having a negligence standard, that there was some known standard that they should have been meeting, that they knew they should have been meeting, but they did not meet. And, and, so, and so, and I think so much of regulation happens ex post. It happens in response to market developments. So we thought Basel II met the minimum capital requirements for banks. We now know that it was inadequate. It allowed not enough capital to be held against securitized asset exposures. And so, so today, a regulator doing the Basel II approach would be held, would be viewed to be ne acting negligently because Basel III is, of course, much stricter. So we have to look ex ante at what the regulators knew and, and was there a standard in, of their behavior that they were not meeting that they knew they should have been that they should have been meeting and whether they breached that behavior or not now i think there is an example in spain and there's an example in a lot of the eu jurisdictions where regulators because of forbearance in the period leading up to the crisis they were just looking the other way they were letting the cajas and all these other smaller institutions make lots of loans that were poorly collateralized and and to uh, you know to debtors that have very bad uh, you know uh, finance financial Back backgrounds and they weren't doing their due diligence. So one could sue supervisors in certain jurisdictions in the EU for, for that, but it would only have to be for, for n known uh, uh, standards that they were not meeting beforehand, yeah, but, but not ex post. Okay, we reached the end of the time for this panel and it remains to me not to try to summarize, but just simply to thank our panelists for uh, giving us uh, a wider perspective than we normally get uh, on these regulatory, legal, and so forth issues that are really fundamental, as far as I'm concerned, uh, fundamental to our understanding of how we do uh, macroprudential uh, regulation. And uh, we're very grateful to you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.